It is great to be back at Victory Life Fellowship, a place that I consider home. Let me make myself comfortable. I wonder if one of the praise team would join us up here just for a moment with Jesse and I. <clears throat> how many are glad you're in the house of God today? How many, how many would rather be in God's house in the best prison in Texas? How many would rather be here than the finest hospital in all the world? Why don't we stand to our feet and just give Jesus Christ a little bit of praise this morning, shall we? Let's just move ourselves back into the Holy Spirit. Praise the name of Jesus. Oh, we offer you praise today and we honor you and we thank you. We honor you and we thank you. Go ahead and sing that, Brother Jesse, a couple times. Freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace. The Let's sing for a moment. There, there is freedom. freedom. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Jesus reigns in this place. feels this morning there is
sense the freedom of the Spirit of the Lord. Give the Lord one more shout of praise together, shall we? Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Amen. You can be seated. It is indeed a privilege to fill this pulpit this morning instead of Pastor Dan, who is on call on his uh, secular job that he has worked for so many years. And we are believing the Lord that with just a short amount of time that God is going to give him the ability to devote all of his time to the house of God and to the work of God. How many of you can believe that? How many of you believe that starting this weekend we'll start a harvest that has yet to ever been realized in this church and in this city? Come on, somebody. Come on. And I want to commend everybody that has worked toward this. I think it's awesome. The Lord has certainly spoken into my, into my spirit about what he wants to do, not just for the remainder of this year. The Christmas holidays are going to be very important this year in harvest. 2008 is a year of new beginnings, and it's going to be the greatest harvest America has ever seen. Do you believe that? And the world, and the world. Oh, man, somebody ought to be responding to that. You know, how you respond to the prophetic word of God is how much of it you'll receive. Did you know that? Amen. You remember when Moses smote the ground, what was it, three times? And the Lord said, you should have smote it six or seven. You should have smote it many times because every time you smote it, that's how many times I would give you victory. How many believe that the greatest year of harvest is upon us? Oh, hallelujah. Well, we're going to see it anyway. Praise God. If you have a Bible, I'm going to turn your attention to the book of Isaiah and again we love Pastor Dan and, and Sister Debbie so much in this church I feel right at home here this is one of the few places I just feel totally at home at and I thank you for that uh, because I have friends here as well as as uh, just people who have been so special to my life over many years and it makes it special Isaiah the 53rd chapter I'm reading from the fourth verse as the prophet peered with a prophetic eye into the future he began to prophesy the coming of the Messiah how many of you know Isaiah was one of the greatest messianic prophets that there ever was prior to Jesus coming and he saw the entire scene he saw what he would go through he saw if you will in his mind what we have seen in drama such as the passion of the Christ the movie that came out many years ago many of us have seen that and uh, he saw it and he began to prophesy it. And so I'm going to pick up the reading in verse number 4 of Isaiah 53. And it says, Surely he has borne our griefs, speaking of the Messiah, speaking of our Jesus, and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Everybody say he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities everybody say he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement for our peace was upon him and brother Sonny you quoted it earlier and by his stripes we are healed can you say amen to that I'm going to pick up the reading in the middle of verse 12 and just read a couple of sentences there because it's important to what we're going to share this morning. Verse number 12 says, Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin, everybody say he bore the sin, of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Would you mind praying with me one more time? Stretch forth your hand and ask the Lord to anoint us, all of us today, and to anoint me, to give me strength to hear, to speak. My voice has been a little bit under the weather, but just pray today for the anointing of God. Father, we thank you for everything that has been done. I thank you for every person that is here. I thank you for the reading of the Word of God. And now we pray for the unction of the anointing. For without the anointing, we can do very little in our preaching, in our teaching, in our abilities, Lord, for they're so limited. But with your anointing and with your Spirit, all things can be done. And it is the anointing that destroys the yoke. And I pray for that anointing. Everybody say, Lord, anoint my ears to hear. 
Now, Lord, I pray that you anoint my mouth to speak, Lord, that we would hear clear the voice of the Lord this morning. We pray over this in Jesus' name. And Satan, the Lord, rebuke you from God's people this day. In Jesus' name, for the word of God is going forth. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. Will you help me preach for a little while this morning? I want to preach to you about the power of the blood of Jesus. Now, some of you have heard this all of your life, and you may think that it's simple, but there is so much more important um, facts to this than just the phrase, the power of the blood. Everybody say, the power of the blood of Jesus. For there is power in his blood. Do you believe that? There is power in the blood of Jesus. I'm going to read, and if you have a pen, you might want to write some notes. If you don't, then, you know, you'll just have to, to just try to remember it. And uh, s some of the scriptures I'm going to give you, I'm going to read. Some of them I'm just going to quote very quickly. But I want to turn to 1 Peter, the, eight, uh, the first chapter, and read from the uh, 18th verse. And it reads like this. Knowing that you were not redeemed. Let me give you a moment to turn there. I, uh, um, 1 Peter 1 18 knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers there was a time in the history of Israel that they even thought they could purchase their way into redemption how many of you know there's been a time in the church world if you will where people literally paid money to try to pay for their sins uh, I won't go into all the history of that uh, but but he's talking about that. He says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. But get this, number 19 says, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Everybody say precious blood. The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. His blood was not just blood from another spotless lamb, but his blood was precious blood for it saves the soul of man. Are you with me this morning? I'm talking about a blood that is more powerful than anything you can imagine. It is the most priceless commodity that has ever come into the world. You could take all of the gold. You could take all of the silver mines. You could take all of the oil wells and put them together and they could not purchase one drop of this blood because this blood is precious blood are you with me today there are a few things in life that are precious that are so precious they were without price one of them was standing up here with her grandmother this morning how much would you give for that child there is no price you see because she is priceless she came into this world as a gift from God she is a life that was born into a family of God but she is a gift of God are you following me today there is no price for one such as that and this is what he's referring to when he says precious blood because you cannot buy this kind of redemption because this blood is so powerful what what is so powerful about it well the Bible talks about the life being in the blood let me turn you to Leviticus I'm going to read first of all I believe in the 17th chapter of Leviticus if you have a Bible certainly turn there and I want you to see this Leviticus 17 verse number 11 for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar, get this, to make atonement for your souls. I'm reading Levit Leviticus 7, 17 and 11. Everybody say, the life is in the blood. And he says, I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is is the blood that makes atonement for the soul how many of you know since the beginning of time it was the shedding of blood that redeemed mankind it was all something had to die blood had to be given the most precious thing you have in your body is your blood did you know that the most precious organ that you have is your heart if it ever stops life is over for you am I right because the blood has got to flow throughout your body this is how powerful blood is the life of everything that we know is in the blood and the blood is powerful. 
The blood has been the cleansing, purifying, atoning, and healing agent that God has used for mankind since man became a sinner, since Adam and Eve. Am I right? Do you remember when they sinned in the garden? What did they do? They went and they sewed fig leaves together to try to cover themselves, which is what mankind has been doing for years, sewing together fig leaves. We call it religion. It can be Islam. It can be Buddhism. It can be Christianity. It can be all types of things that we do where we sew together our fig leaves and we try to cover our nakedness before God. We try to cover our shame. But let me tell you, there is nothing that can do it except for the shedding of blood. God even came onto the scene and he looked at Adam and Eve and he said, I know what you're trying to do, but he said, what you don't understand is every time that a sin is committed, blood is demanded by me. And so he slew animals and he took the clothes of those animals and he clothed his own children in the clothing of animals. Why? So that they would remember that it was blood that covered their nakedness. Everybody say there's power in the blood of Jesus. What kind of power? It's the kind of power that saves us. It's the kind of power that purifies us. It's the kind of power that cleanses us. It's the blood that heals us, renews us, sanctifies us, and protects us. Do you believe that today? John 6, 54 says, his blood has eternal life in it. God said, my, or Jesus said, this blood, my blood, will have eternal life in it. It's not blood that will just throw your sins ahead for a little while, but it is life-changing, soul-redeeming, heart-cleansing blood, and everybody needs the blood in their life. Are you hearing me today? And it doesn't take long for the blood to be applied. It doesn't take but just a second in time for God to apply his blood to your life. Everybody say there's power in the blood of Jesus. Acts 20, 27 says it like this. He purchased us. Jesus purchased us with his own blood. Priceless. How important are you to him? You're priceless. He gave gave the highest price that was ever paid for you. Everybody say, he did that for me. Because he loves me. He gave his blood for me. You'll never understand how much he loves you until you get the revelation that had you been the only one on the earth, he would have still come and still went to a cross and still died just for you to be saved. Oh, don't you love him for that? Revelation 1 and 5 says, Jesus loved us. Everybody say, Jesus loves us. And he washed us from our sin. And it says, in his own blood. Why? Because that was precious blood. Not the blood of, of goats and bullocks and not the, not the goat of turtle, the, the blood of turtle doves or whatever that, that the sacrifice might have been, a, even a spotless lamb. But his blood was so precious. Why? Because it is what makes us the children of God. Everybody say, his blood makes me a child of God oh hallelujah what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus we used to sing that back in the old days in the church what can wash away my sins and then we would sing there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb and I am one who knows what that power can do because he transformed my life as just a young man I was headed to hell as fast as I could get there but brother Sonny the blood of Jesus came into my life and it made all the difference in the world Oh, somebody give the Lord a little bit of praise this morning for the blood. I was raised in, in, in Pentecost, or, or when I got saved, it was in the Pentecostal church, and, and we, were, we were very uh, exuberant about Acts chapter 2, and I can quote, you know, the first many, cha- first many verses of it, because, you know, in the beginning, you know, it's, it's so important to understand that, but what sometimes we overlooked in our Pentecostalism, if you will, is just how important and precious and powerful that the blood of Jesus really is. Oh, do you love him today? It's the only thing that can break generational curses. It's the only thing that can break the generational curses. 
It is the very thing. It is the very thing that God comes and puts into our lives. You quoted it again. You, it's almost like you gave me an introduction, Brother Sonny, when you were up here talking about the blood. For you said, I believe it's Revelation 12, where it says, and they overcame him, who? The devil. By the word, of, by, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. But the most important part of that is the blood of the lamb. Because without the blood of the lamb, there is no word of testimony. You don't have anything to testify about. But when the blood of the lamb comes into your life, you become a witness. You become a blood washed, blood bought child of God. And you're a witness of the Lord. Come on, somebody. And give him a little bit of praise this morning. You see, the devil is a liar when he comes to you and he accuses you of everything that you've done wrong. Because I'm here to tell you, I'm looking into the faces of a group of imperfect people. You're looking into the, into the face of an imperfect being. And it's not because I want to be, but it's because I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And I am trying my best to live for God. But let me tell you something. There are days that I miss the mark. How about you? But I say, thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood that washes white as snow. I want to give you a revelation that the Lord just gave to me. This is powerful stuff. We'll slow down just a little bit and turn you to Hebrews. I want to give you a chance to turn there and read this. The Lord spoke this to me this morning. And I had learned something about this a particular verse here. But the Lord spoke to me something this morning. And I had never seen this in my entire life. And I hope it blesses you like it has me already this morning. I'm reading out of Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Everyone there? I'm going to read verse number 22, which I would read probably anyway if I was preaching about the blood of Jesus. But I'm going to look at it and examine it for a few minutes today. Verse number 22. And according to the law, almost all things were purged or purified with blood. Everybody say blood. Blood. It was used in the Old Testament by the priests constantly using blood, constantly sanctifying with blood, sprinkling of the blood, pouring the blood on the mercy seat. Uh, the day of atonement, the greatest day, the highest day in all of Israel was when the high priest would go beyond the veil. The only person who could go beyond the veil was the high priest and he would take the atoning blood and pour it upon the mercy seat for the sins of all of Israel where they would be cleared and free for one more year and it was a celebration time after that everybody say the power of the blood because God would look down upon the mercy seat and he would say okay there's blood there I'm going to withhold my judgment from you but how many know that when Jesus Christ went into the holy of holies or went into the heavenlies that he took his own blood and he poured it upon the mercy seat and God looked at it and he said now that's perfect that's I'm satisfied with that no longer will there have to be a sacrifice anymore because that blood satisfies Oh, somebody say praise the Lord. All things purged, purified with blood. Now get this. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. That's how powerful the blood is. That's why the preaching of the blood is, is the most important message. The preaching of Christ, the preaching of the cross. G, uh, it was Paul who said, I choose to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because that's the only way to get to heaven. Through that blood, it's the only way that you're going to get there. That's why we're doing an outreach next week. Why? Because if they don't get the blood, I'm telling you, they're not going there. But if they get the blood, they've got to it to eternal life that they can't buy with all the money in the world somebody give the Lord praise today and it talks about it in this particular chapter now look at this I'm going to read verse 26. It says, because this whole thing's talking about the blood, blood of goats, cows. But he says, with his own blood, he entered into, I'm reading verse 12 now, I'm backing up. He entered into the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption with his own blood. He's talking about that. Are you ready for this? I'm going to say, I'm, I'm, going to say I'm ready for this. 
Verse 26, then he would have had to suffer, then he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once, everybody say once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Did you get that? Did you get that? That's powerful stuff, isn't it? The next verse is where I'm trying to get to. Now, now get this. And it says, And as it is appointed for men once to die, or to die once, but after this, the judgment. Now we use that a lot to be evangelistic, right? To tell people, you know, hey, you, you're going to die and then there's going to be judgment. But can I back up a little bit and show you what I've learned about this particular word judgment and what this means, what he's really looking for in this particular passage. How many know everybody's going to die once? Amen. You've got to go through that process. And I was just, I'll, I'll share this with you, but I was just at, at the funeral of a 27-year-old young man. He's a preacher's son, a great pastor in the city. I preached in his pulpit. And, and, and it, was a, it was a tragic event for them, but yet it was a celebration like I had never seen. A three-hour funeral. At the end of the funeral, they were preaching, and the pastor was up giving an altar call. And there was seven, 800 people there, and they came streaming to the altar unsaved people to get saved with a casket in the front of the church why because there's power in the blood of Jesus and there's power to save even in a funeral come on somebody everybody says appointed once unto man to die but after this the judgment are you ready for this this particular word judgment from the Greek is literally where we get our word forensic from. Forensic is a science. We use it a lot in criminology. How many have ever heard of a TV show called CSI? Crime scene investigation. Those are criminologists. They're crime scene investigators. And they use a science called forensic. This particular word is where we get the word forensic from. Are you still with me today? All right, come on. Don't, 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 don't leave me just yet. you got to get this. And, and what happens, listen to me, when, when, you, when you die and you're going to stand before God, we all think he's going to look at us and he's going to try to find the sin in our lives. No, what he's going to be looking for for is one thing he's going to be looking for his blood upon your life he's going to be with forensic science looking at you and examining and saying where is the blood is the blood applied is the blood there because if it is he's going to say come on in because of the blood of my son come on somebody and give him praise when the death angel came through to Israel, what was the death angel looking for? The, the death angel didn't peer inside of the window to see what was going on. The death angel didn't come by to say, have you lived your life just perfect? The death angel came by and he looked and he said, is there blood upon the doorpost? And if there was blood upon the doorpost, then everything was all right. You were going to pass over. Are you with me? You were going to pass over into the promised land. Everybody say he's looking for the blood. Blood's a powerful thing. I said blood is a powerful thing. I mean, you know, we have such high technology today and forensic science that if they find blood at, at a crime scene, they can pretty much figure out who done it. You know what I'm saying? I heard a story about where there was a murder committed and they covered it up with four, four coats of paint on the wall. Four coats of latex paint upon the wall. Oil-based paint. Is that oil-based, brother? The latex? What's the one that is? Whatever, okay. I, I know he's painted some for me before. <laughs> he knows paint. Praise God. Whatever. The good stuff, all right? But do you know that they have lighting now that can come in? It's some type of a, a, a powerful uh, light 
and, and, and they can shine it. And, and even through four coats of paint, they could find the blood from that crime scene. How many know, even when, when they go, they're always looking for what? What's the one thing they're looking for? Blood. Why? Because blood is evidence. In the blood is the DNA. You can't escape your DNA. You're the only person who has your DNA. But aren't you glad that there is one who came into the world, that he had a DNA that was above every DNA in all of the earth, and his name was Jesus, and he poured his blood out upon the mercy seat. And that blood is applied to your life, and all God's looking for in your life is is the blood there. Oh, somebody give him praise. You ought to get happy about that. Whew. Can I keep going for just a little while? Praise God. Gives us a little bit of hope, doesn't it? Praise God. Because I'm telling you, if I had to go before the judgment on my own, I would be completely lost. And so would you. Don't act so perfect. Don't act so religious today. But if you've got the blood, if you have the blood applied to your life, he's looking. His forensic is looking for one thing. Not were you perfect, but did you heed? Did you be covered in my blood? Everybody say the blood of Jesus is powerful. I want to turn your attention to something that I know that you know and that you've heard, but I want you to see it because there's people here who haven't heard it and do not know this. But it's been a revelation that is literally changing my life and the lives of others that receive it. Um, I'm reading this time from Leviticus, the 16th chapter. And I'm going to be reading from one verse. Now, I could take you on several verses where this is in the Bible, but for time's sake, we'll just pick one out. Is that all right? Leviticus 16 chapter number 19 this is talking about the priest when he was doing some sanctification and he would go before the veil of the temple the veil of the holy of holies and there was many times that he would cleanse like if he was going to cleanse a house or cleanse a leper he would do something seven times but it shows what he does here in the 19th verse of the 16th chapter and it says, Then he, the priest, shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times. Everybody say seven times. Cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Everybody say it is the blood that sanctifies and the priest would do this on several occasions but he would dip his finger and one two three four five six seven times he would sprinkle it and I know some of you've heard this priest and your pastor has taught this before and I've heard him teach it I've heard him teach it in Africa and and, and we and you know it's, it's a message that really uh, I think Larry Huck probably first came up with or Benny Hinn but somebody like that but I had never heard it before but I have studied it and I have let it become a part of my life and do you know that the high priest who came from the heavenlies came into this world to sprinkle his blood in the earth seven times can we talk about the seven times just for a few minutes I know some of you know it but but bear with those who've never heard it before that when Jesus came into this world he came has anybody ever seen the movie the passion of the Christ the word passion literally comes from what Jesus did in his final hours on the earth that's the origination of the Latin term passion it comes from what Jesus did why and that's why we say when you do something do it with passion what does that mean with everything you've got and Jesus gave us everything he had because all he had was his blood. Oh, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't even, even his, his, his nature. It, wasn't, it, it was what coursed through his veins that was the most precious commodity to ever enter the atmosphere of humanity. Thirteen pints of the most life-changing substance and he came into this world and if you recall the movie and I don't have time to be as graphic uh, I'd love to just show it but you know you could see it and I did that one time at a church uh, last year or no last spring I think it was I showed the passion of the Christ and at the end gave an altar call and you know people came forward to receive him just seeing that movie I didn't preach all I did was get up and give an altar call at the end of the passion and people came forward why because they saw how much he loved us that he 
he gave his all for us. Did you know that movie has won more Muslims than any other tool that has ever been produced? Why? Because they realize he loved us just that much. That he came and he gave himself for us as a sacrifice once and for all. But he shed his blood seven times. Everybody say seven times. You probably all know the first place that he shed it because you've been taught it here well. But the first place that he shed his blood, you know, you ask some people, where did Jesus shed his blood? And they said, he shed his blood on the cross, but he shed his blood in more places than just the cross. How many of you know that to be true? But the first place that he shed his blood is so significant for you and I because he did it in a place called Gethsemane. Dan Peters and myself have been to Gethsemane together and we have been in that garden. It's just up the Mount of Olives, I believe, from the, from the uh, Eastern Gate. Am I right? Isn't that pretty much where it is in Jerusalem? And, um, and everybody say, we're glad Pastor Dan is here. Give him a hand. Amen. He made it. He made it. And I love this brother very dearly. So the first place that he went was in Gethsemane. And there is when he prayed. And he prayed with all earnesty. He prayed and the Bible says he agonized in prayer. Why? Because of, of what he was about to partake of. Not just the suffering, but the drinking of the cup of every sin that would ever be committed on the planet. Every heinous crime, every rape, every molestation, everything that could be hideous and harmful, every devil worship activity, he had to drink the cup of our sin and he went into the garden and he prayed and these were his exact words paraphrased he said father if there be another way let this cup pass from me if it's possible that there's another way but you see it wasn't possible because we had to have the precious blood of Christ we had to have what was flowing through his veins and he prayed and he tried to get his disciples to stay up with him through the night you remember he was saying come on pray with me I'm in agony I'm agonizing right now but they fell asleep but then he, the Bible says, but he prayed more earnestly even after that until something happened that is a medical phenomena where literally out of his sweat glands, he began to bleed blood. Blood began to protrude. Why? It's a, it's a, it's a medical phenomena. They call it hematidrosis is the medical term, but it literally means bloody sweat. It is where the tiny capillaries in the sweat glands will burst under extreme pressure. I heard a man say, he talked to a doctor who said, I have seen that happen over 100 times in my office when I would give someone news that, was, that they did not want to hear. It may, maybe it was a, a sentence of, of there's nothing we can do or you only have so much time left. And under such agony and under such pain, they would literally start sweating blood, sweating blood out of their pores. And this is the first place that Jesus shed his blood. Why? Because he finally got to the place sister Kathy where he said not my will but thine be done why it was in a garden called Eden that man for the very first time said not thy will but my will be done and he lost everything that we were supposed to inherit but thank God that the last Adam came the second or last Adam came and he came into a garden and he said what your first son lost in a garden I will win back in a garden myself but I have to pray and pray sweat out of my sweat or blood out of my sweat glands somebody say thank you Jesus and when he did that he gave you and I the ability one more time to do the will of God somebody say by the blood I can do the will of God oh you can't do it by your flesh I promise you you can't do it with even your talent you can't do it with all of the of the good works you can muster up but by the blood you can do the will of God Somebody said that was one. I'm going to hurry. What's the next place he shed his blood? You know it well. They took him to the whipping post. Again, but the son, he talked about it. Took him to the whipping post. Why? Because Isaiah had prophesied. And he said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. But he saw beyond that. And he said, but, but to something else. With his stripes, we are healed. 
And you saw the depiction, if you saw the movie, where the Roman soldiers took him. A Roman soldier trained in the art of torture. Knew how to just rip a person's body apart with the cat of nine tails. With bone and glass and, and fragments that were tied into the lashes. And he would, he would, he would slap with, with all of his might and then he would jerk the flesh off of his back leaving nothing but raw meat they say most people died from a scourging but Jesus lived through the scourging why was he doing that why was he doing that because he took his stripes on his back so that you and I could be healed not just in our bodies how many of you know he heals our bodies how many can testify he's ever healed your body before 30 years later I'm standing here after being diagnosed with hepatitis and I don't have a sign in, in, in my body. Why? Because with his stripes he healed me. With his stripes he healed me. But he heals you emotionally. He heals you mentally. And he heals you spiritually. He heals the heart. Can I keep going? Everybody says Jesus won back our health. The next place, and this is powerful. Can I keep going? Everybody say that was two. The next place that he shed his blood was where? Do you remember? When the Roman soldiers plated a crown of thorns. After, you see, Pontius Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. His wife had had a dream. You know the story. And he was trying to get out of it, so he scourged him. He had him beaten within an inch of his life. And he brings him back before the crowd with all of the blood already flowing all over his body. A broken, beaten man. And he says, behold the man. In other words, he's saying, isn't this enough to satisfy your bloodthirstiness? And they said, no, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Because that was what the devil wanted. He thought, if I could kill the Son of God, I can still reign upon the earth. But little did he know, had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because once he was, once his blood began to flow, he purchased back dominion for you and I. Somebody give him praise. But but they took a crown of thorns and they weaved it into a mock uh, a crown and they, they pushed it down into his skull and the thorns went into his head. And little did they know, but they were fulfilling a prophecy that had to be done for you and I. Everybody turn with me to Genesis, the fourth chapter. You got to see this. Some of you don't know this. Some of you know it well, but hang, 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 with, hang with those who need to hear it for the first time. Is that all right? Genesis 3, I'm sorry. Genesis 3. And then God says to Adam, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I have commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Basically, he's saying, because you have sinned. Look at this. Cursed is the ground for your sake and in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life get this both thorns everybody say thorns and thistles shall bring forth and they're going to choke out your prosperity if you don't mind me para paraphrasing they're going to choke out the, the your crops you're going to have to fight the thorns you're going to have to fight the thistles you're going to have to fight with the sweat of your brow you're going to have to to, to to fight to ever get anything out of the earth because how many of you know God had provided everything for Adam all he had to do was go pick it go 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 just enjoy what God had given to him which is where you and I are heading one day how many of you know that but what they did is they took a crown of thorns and the Bible says they plated it or pressed it into his skull. And when that happened, ladies and gentlemen, he won back our prosperity. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I said he won back our prosperity. Now this is a message that the body of Christ, some enjoy something. Oh, we can't preach that. We've got to preach that. Do you know why? Because God is about to bring the greatest transfer of wealth that has ever been seen in the history of the world into the kingdom of God. Why? Because we're in the final days. We're in the last bit of the race. And we've got to get the job done before he comes. It's not to see who can have the biggest yacht. It's to see who can reach China with the gospel. Who can reach the dark continent of Africa with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Oh, everybody say, prosperity is mine because Jesus took the curse upon himself. I'm going to work on this just for a moment. Is that all right? Galatians 3. Galatians 3. Look at this. Watch this. Verse number 10. Galatians 3. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you're not doing all the law and keeping all the law, you're under a curse. Right? And people who want to live by the law shall die by the law. Amen. I know there's a lot of great religions that do good works, but they do it based on law. The, the Koran has a lot of good philosophy in it. And let me just leave it there. Philosophy. Hello. But let me tell you something. Good works is not enough. Why? Because you're still under the curse unless blood has come in to your life. Oh, not just any blood, but the blood of the Savior. Look at this, verse 11. No one is justified by the law in the sight of God. Everybody needs to get that. No one is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Now get this, this is where I'm trying to get to. Christ, everybody say Jesus, has redeemed us. Everybody say redeemed us. From the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus became our curse and took the curse of poverty upon himself with the crown of thorns. Why? So that the blessing, look at the next verse, the blessing of Abraham who had plenty, the richest man in the earth, so that the blessing of Abraham could come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Everybody say the curse of poverty is broken off of my life because of the blood of Jesus. Now if you believe that, give him praise. Come on, give him praise. I believe that God is bringing prosperity into this church. I have seen it. I have believed it. I have prophesied it. And let me tell you something. One of the largest seeds I ever sown in my entire life in the kingdom of God, I sowed into this building project. Why? Because God wanted to plant this church here. And I sowed my seed into good ground. And you know what? That seed is coming back to me a thousandfold. How many have been sowing seed into this good ground? Lift your hands right now. Let's pray right now. Come on. If you want the curse of poverty broken off your life, lift your hands right now, right where you said in the name of Jesus father by the by the crown of thorns that was on Jesus's brow we break we break the curse of poverty oh off of every life because you are sowing seed and when you sow seed oh I feel the Holy Ghost right now God is about to bring a financial increase into somebody's life like you've never seen it before somebody shout yes, yes. Mm. Give him praise right now. I feel the Holy Ghost. Let's just stop for a moment. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Lift your hands and pray. Oh, praise God. That is a powerful, powerful word for me. Amen. That's a powerful word for you. Why? Because I need right now the prosperity of God in my life. How about you? Whew. It's powerful. Come on, go ahead and pray just a little bit more. I don't want to miss the Holy Ghost right now. Somebody, somebody's life is about to be res resurrected and turned around. There's a turnaround. I don't know who you are, but in somebody's life, something is about to happen financially. There's a breaking in the spirit. Floodwaters are just over your head. There is a, a window of heaven that is about to open, and he is going to pour out for you a blessing where which you cannot contain him. Says the Spirit of the Lord to you somebody's getting it right now somebody's getting it right now is it going to be you is it going to be me thank 
Glory to God. Whew. Pastor Dan, prosperity's coming to this house like you've never seen it in all of the times that you've pastored. Everybody say yes. By say in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. That means so be it. Whew, I can't hardly move off of this point. This is powerful for somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wait on him just a little bit more. Lift your hands one more time. Come on, it won't hurt you a bit. His hands were pierced. They were suspended. We can lift ours. Oh, we lift our hands to you, Lord. And we say, pour out. Pour out upon us a blessing whereby we cannot contain it. That it's overflowing. It's pressed down. It's shaken together. And it's running over into the kingdom of God. So that I am a conduit of blessing. I am a conduit of blessing. Somebody say, I am a vessel of blessing. I am a vessel of blessing. Who? Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit right now in a powerful way. Go ahead and start playing, Brother Jesse. I'm going to bring this to a close in just a moment. Play softly. Play real softly. Whew. If he starts playing, y'all will think I'm about done, right? Whew. Everybody say, that's three. What was the fourth place? When they took our Savior's sinless hands. The hands that had touched the fevered brow. The hands that had, had touched the widowed child. The widow's child, only child, raised that from the dead. The hands that had hugged children that ran to him. They took the sinless, spotless Savior's hands and they laid them out upon the wood of the cross. And they began to drive those huge spikes through his hands as his flesh quivered under the, under the awesome pain that he had to endure. But what was he doing? Everybody say, Jesus' hands were pierced and blood flowed from his hands. Why? So that our hands would be blessed, that everything we touch now can be blessed. How many believe? Come on, lift your hands if you want your hands to be blessed right now. Lift your hands if you want them to be blessed. Father, you see every hand that is raised right now. And because these hands are raised right now, I prophesy. That's why we lay hands on the sick. Did you know that? We lay hands on the sick because Jesus' hands were pierced. And when we lay our hands upon them, it is not our hands being laid. It is his hand being laid upon them. Because blood flows out of his hands now everything that you touch shall prosper I speak that into your life if your hands are raised right now everything that you touch shall prosper from this day forward everybody say I receive that because of the blood oh hallelujah let me let me hurry everybody say that's four what's the fifth place where they pierced his feet same type of spikes and they nailed his feet to that cross why so that we could one more time are you hearing me walk in dominion walk in dominion everybody say my feet are blessed because of the blood of Jesus did you know that everywhere Adam walked he walked in dominion did you know the Bible says that God gave him this commandment to go forth and subdue the entire earth there was only one garden called Eden but it was his mandate and mission in life to walk through the earth and make the entire earth a garden of Eden how I believe he was going to speak the word of God he was going to speak and command it to happen he was to drive the devil out of the earth he was not to bow his knee to the devil but he was to walk in dominion that is why there were times that God even told Israel ever every step that you take every pl every place you plant your foot I'm gonna give it to you how many want to take this city for Jesus Christ how many want to take the city for Jesus well we got to do a little bit of walking we got to get out of these four walls and take dominion everybody say we have dominion because of the blood that flowed from Jesus feet that's why he said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature amen walking in dominion everybody say that's five how many know the sixth place where he shed his blood the sixth place that he shed his blood was when because it was a special Sabbath 
play real softly because it was a special Sabbath. The Jews could not have anybody hanging on a cross when their Sabbath began and so they came and the only way for a person to live being crucified was to push up on their feet to be able to get air into their lungs and so it was a massive painful event it was a horrible way to die the, the guillotine was created literally as a merciful killing did you know that because crucifixion just finally became such a horrible way to die we even in humanity when we have the death penalty we try to do it as painless as possible do we not but this was a horrible shameful way to die and he's on a cross and he's still alive and he can still breathe and so they're, they're thinking well it's time for us to come and to to be sure that they die quickly before the sun goes down so they were going to break their legs and when they got to Jesus they had found he was already gone why because he had power over his own spirit are you hearing me he had power over his own spirit they did not take his life from him he laid it down am I right there were 12,000 angels waiting in heaven all he would have had to do is look up and say come and they would have come down and they would have wiped out the whole thing and they would have taken the precious Son of God back to where he belonged but he finished his course and the Bible said he bowed his head which means he worshiped God as his final act and he gave up his spirit right he gave up the ghost so when they got to him they didn't have to break his legs because it had been prophesied not a bone in his body would be broken am I right and so the soldier to be sure took a spear and he put it up between the rib cage and he slipped it up and he punctured his heart to be sure that he's dead and he pulled the sword out and when he did blood and water came out proven that he had his heart had bursted within him somebody even has put it this way Jesus died of a broken heart why why did he die of a broken heart so he could mend ours everybody say so he could mend me they they pierced his heart to restore joy into our lives everybody say his heart bled so I could have joy back in my life everybody say that six and I'm almost done how many of you believe it and then finally the seventh place that he shed his blood you remember when we first read our text it says he was wounded for our transgressions there's three types of sin we're three-dimensional beings God is a three-dimensional God your body your soul and your spirit am I right and there's three dimensions of sin there is sin there is transgression and there is iniquity are we together sin is what we all do practically on a daily basis when we miss the mark it means it's like if you took if that if that poster board back there was a target and I took a bow and arrow and I shot for the bullseye and I missed it a little bit I'm trying but I'm missing how many of you know you have days that are like that right all of us do but that's why we say thank God for the blood right Everybody say thank God for the blood and then there there is a thing called it says he was wounded for our transgressions a wound is something that where you cut and you bleed on the outward and you can see the blood flowing the hands then the, the 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 feet the the back the the brow the you know all of that you see those wounds and they bleed on the outside and he was wounded for our transgressions now transgression is when you absolutely just break the law you know to do good and you just mess it up and don't look at me so religiously because every one of you've done that too hello somebody you've known to do what to do and you did the opposite aren't you glad he was wounded for your transgressions but are you with me but the Bible says he was bruised for our iniquities verse 12 said he bore the sin of many but it says but he was bruised for our iniquities what is a bruise I have one on my arm right now a bruise is when the blood vessels burst on the inside and you bleed inwardly but not outwardly and nobody can see the blood and nobody can see the cut they might can see the, the, the bruise but he bled on the inside so that he could heal us of all of our iniquities are, are we together are we still together 
Your iniquities are those things that you inherited, those things you never asked for, the things that you just grew up with, the abuses that you had to deal with that when, when you were young. I want you to stand with me right now because I'm just about to close this out. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. One of the greatest examples that I have, one of the greatest examples that I have that he was bruised for our iniquities is when he was climbing up Mount Golgotha, when he was climbing up to Calvary to lay his life down for us. How many know he fell under the weight of his own cross and he couldn't carry it any longer? And he dropped our, our broken, bruised, wounded, almost blood-drained Savior. Face in the dirt, can't, can't get up anymore. So one of the Roman soldiers ruthlessly looks into the crowd. There was a traveler in town. His name was Simon. Simon, we know him from Cyrene. We call him Simon the Cyrenian or Simon from Cyrene. And he reached out and he grabbed Simon. Why? He just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But you might want to say he was in the wrong place at the right time. And he said, you, you know, sin has no heart. Death has no heart. Sickness has no heart. It doesn't stop to ask you, is this what you want? Yeah, I didn't ask for many of the things that happened in my childhood. But let me tell you something. They happened anyway. But there was a Savior. Are you getting me? There was a Savior who was bruised on the inside for the things that I had nothing to do with. Oh, it wasn't my sin. It wasn't my transgression. It was my iniquities. And we can either let him heal us of them or we can carry them all of our lives if we want to. Are you hearing me? But Simon the Cyrene was pulled out of the crowd accidentally. Not, not, there was no, there was no purpose. It was just random. He just, John, he picked you and said, come here. He said, you're carrying his cross because he can't carry it anymore. Do you know some of us are carrying crosses that we never, never expected to have to bear in this life. Some of us are carrying crosses. But you see, the thing about Simon the Cyrene is all he had to do was get that cross to the top of Calvary and he could lay it down and Jesus would die on it for him. Are you with me? And for all of us, close your eyes with me right now. Because the Holy Spirit is speaking to someone in this room as I, as I preach, as I close. Somebody pray in the Holy Ghost because somebody's life is fi fixing to be changed. I'm speaking to somebody right now, and you've carried that cross long enough. You have bore your own iniquity long enough. Jesus was bruised for the hurts on the inside, the things that you didn't have any control over. Simon, why? He's thinking, why me? Why do I have to carry this? You don't have to carry it forever, Simon. Just get it to the top of the hill. But some of you have been bearing a cross that's not yours to bear. It's not yours to die on. We all have our own crosses, but this is not one. This is one that somebody else thrust on you, and I'm talking to you right now. And the blood of Jesus is flowing in this room right now. And he's come to deliver you from that iniquity. To deliver you from it. I don't know who you are. But I'm going to ask everybody that will to walk up to the front with me right now. Just step up here. Take a few steps toward freedom. Take a few steps toward freedom. Because the blood of Jesus is flowing in this room right now. And let me tell you, the hardest sin to get rid of is that iniquity. Because it's on the inside. We can hide it so well. Others can't see it. We mask it. We dress it up. We put smiles on our faces when we're really hurting inside. But Jesus said, you don't understand. I was bruised for what's hurting on the inside of you. You need him to heal something on the inside right now. Lift your hands to him. Somebody needs to lay down a cross that's not yours to bear any longer. Are you hearing me? Lay it down and let him die on it for you. Brother Jesse, get ready to sing softly in just a moment. The Holy Ghost is moving in this house. The Holy Ghost is moving in this house. God is speaking to you right now. 
Some of you, I can lay my hands upon you right now because the Lord's showing me what you're going through. You're going through a battle and you've condemned yourself. And he's saying, stop today. Don't condemn yourself anymore because I was bruised. When you stand before me, I am not going to say to you, did you live perfect? I'm simply going to look and see if my blood is there. He's looking for the blood. He's looking for the blood. He's looking for the blood. You see, Jesus didn't die and shed his blood for nothing. But he shed it outwardly and he shed it inwardly so we could be healed outwardly and inwardly. And you don't need to carry the pain and you don't need to carry the shame any longer, says the Spirit of the Lord to you. But give it up to me. Give it up to me. Sing, Brother Jesse, as our hands are lifted. Sing, Brother Jesse, whatever the Lord's put on your heart. Oh, Rabahara Shanda. And we praise you. That's perfect. That's perfect. Listen to this. Come on, lift your hands. He's singing to you. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Hold, hold the drums. Washes Just for a minute. Just for a minute. Listen to it. The Lord is singing to you. And he's singing it like this. Oh, my blood. My blood. I'm called Jesus. I'm called Jesus. Oh, the blood. His blood. His blood. Singing. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Sing it one more time like that. Oh, Man, there's some of you I feel such a burden for right now. Jesus is trying to touch you. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood. Everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. It washes white as snow. snow. One, one more, more. one more. Snow. Listen to it. He washes white as snow. Play freedom and sing it in just a moment. Lift your hands to him right now. Somebody, right now, you need to symbolically just lay down that cross. A cross that was thrust on you. When your father walked out, hang on, hang on. When your father walked out of your life, you started carrying a cross. And you've carried it for long enough. The Lord's saying, put it down. Because you've got a new father now and you're a new child. When your mother turned her back on you, didn't understand you. Come on, I'm talking to somebody. Somebody here that's been abused sexually, I'm speaking into your life. You were thrust a cross on you that you didn't deserve. You were just picked out of a crowd. It's not because that you weren't, you weren't good or you weren't good enough. Jesus said, you're so good that I'll die for you. Jesus said, you're my hidden treasure in a field. I'll purchase the whole field just to have you. He's speaking to you right now. I'll purchase the entire field just to have you. That's for you. That's for you. Oh, somebody say yes. Sing it softly. Go ahead. Come on, come on, someone needs to be set free today. Lift your hands. Help him sing it, help him sing it. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Oh, the 
Spirit of the Lord is moving right now. If you're tired and you Come on, lift your, hands, lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. Lift your hands. If you're tired and you are thirsty, there is freedom. Freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace. They Let's let the Holy Ghost move. Let's let the Holy Ghost move. John, before you lift your hands, I know you got already got your hands lifted, but everybody stretch forth your hands. Lift your hands. Give your all to Jesus. Ah, there is freedom. Ra, sha, In the name of mercy.
Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Eat all up. Everybody stretch forth your hands. Keep singing it, Jesse. If you're tired and you're thirsty, sing it like that. Listen to this. If you're tired and you are thirsty, I don't care who you are. There is freedom. If you're tired and you are thirsty, there is freedom. Come on, freedom come on, come on, Jesus. Freedom is raised in this place. Showers of mercy and praise.
keep playing it, keep playing it, just like that. He total blues. Huh? All right, everybody stretch forth your hands over young David. I felt even before he went to class to lay my hand upon him today. So everybody that will, just stretch forth your hand. And I'll be the point of contact for us all and for the Holy Spirit. And I prophesy over his life. He is called David because there's a kingly anointing on him. And he's going to be raised up to do mighty things in the kingdom. Satan, the Lord rebuke you from this boy's life. The Lord rebuke you from David's life. From dreams, anything that shakes him up. And peace like a river. Peace that flows like a river from the presence of God from the presence of God. Let me pray for you. Amen. Brother Peter, lay your hand upon him. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over your child, your son, right now. In the name of Jesus. Sing that part, part that says if you're, if, you're, if you're tired and thirsty. Because I feel like that you've been weary. You've been weary with well-doing. You've been on a long journey. But the Lord says I'm bringing you into a time of refreshing. A time of renewal. I have not left you, nor has my hand ever lifted from you, says the Spirit of the Lord. But my hand is upon you even now. Not only have I never left you, I never will leave you. For you are mine and you are committed to me. And my blood is upon you. And I look for my blood and I see my blood. Minister to him, Brother Peter. Minister to him for a minute. Mother in the Lord. And Father, I pray strength into her life and her body. Everybody stretch forth your hand. One of the sweetest saints of God on the planet right here. You have prayed for many. And those prayers have been a memorial before me, says the Spirit of the Lord. And you shall even see some of them come to pass. But all will come to pass because they stand before me. And be strengthened in my spirit today. Be strengthened in my spirit today. Be strengthened in my spirit today.
Everybody give the Lord one more big shout of praise. Sister Jody. Praise the Lord. I know if you were touched like I was from the Holy Spirit himself this morning, I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul when he taught and he said, as I give in to you, it is your duty to give in to me. Not that he needed the money, but the gospel needed to be preached. And wherever this man of God goes that you just heard speak, wherever he goes, you can tell right now from what you heard that the Word of God will be preached. So we want to sow this morning into His life and into His ministry.